Unfortunately, no school is immune to that subject. As bus drivers, we know that when we have a report, if a child on our bus comes up or we hear conversation of a child threatening to hurt themselves, or maybe another child on the bus comes up and says, Jimmy said he was going to hurt himself. We know that we have that report, that duty to report that information to the supervisor, to the director, so that we can get action taken on that. It's pretty common, actually, uh, for that uh, phone call to happen for us from you guys. Some of you know what I'm talking about, and others fortunately don't. But don't dismiss, don't dismiss anything like that. Just like we've said all through these trainings, we would rather investigate something that's not going to happen than not investigate and not intervene in a situation that could end in a tragedy with the loss of all these kids. So uh, certainly encourage you at any time to, to report when a child threatens to hurt themselves on that suicide. All right, so we're going to finish up uh, here with some sections uh, require training again. This is the acceptable use of technology. Uh, I heard a bunch of dings and beans and, and chimes go off. I sent a remind message out, so everybody get your cell phone out first. And this is especially for the new drivers. I sent that remind out just to make sure that everyone is receiving those remind messages. If you have not received that message, be sure to get with me or Marshall some point today before the start of school so we can get you set up in that remind system. Sub drivers included. Uh, we, that way you can be, you can stay up to date on anything, any information that we put out to you. Now having said that, the acceptable use of technology. Uh, it's a legal citation we see here from KAR, Kentucky Administrative Regulation. Prevention of sexually explicit materials transmitted, transmitted to schools via the computer. But of course we know also we all have a computer in our hands. And just be aware of that. I don't think we have anybody here to, to worry about engaging in that activity. But we do have to also realize that the Laura County policy and procedures are things that we're not allowed to do. And whenever you log into your phone and you're using the school's Wi-Fi, that opens your phone up to monitoring through the IT department. Just need to be aware of that, okay? Creating and using websites, tweet, Twitter uh, accounts, Facebook accounts, any other online service, Snapchat, Instagram, I'm not even sure what the other ones are because I don't use any of them. And part of that's for a reason, and part of that's I don't want to try to learn something new. But uh, you can't use anything or any purposely that represents itself as a district, school, sanctioned site or account other than the teacher websites provided to all teachers and schools by the district. You can't send a mass email. Say you sell, I don't know if this is still a thing, but Avon. If you sell Avon, you can't use the school computer, your school email, to send out a mass email to your customer list because it's going to have that tag of Laura County Schools. On the note of your school email, let me say this. If you have not signed in to your email in the past couple, three months, obviously, over the course of the summer. Try to do that as quickly as possible when you get back into school, whether it be at the kiosk there at the bus garage or maybe you have access to a kiosk at your elementary school you drive out of. Because it's, it's important that you do that, especially for those of you that we end up providing assistance to for doing your living well uh, and insurance related type items because we spend, they spend hours and hours of time helping you to do that. We don't mind to do that. But Dave can tell you, what do you spend the most time doing, Dave? 
reset the passwords because you've not signed into your email. So just sign into that email. You can get your uh, you can get your check stubs through that real simple. I'll save you a trip to the garage if you don't want to come up and do that. You can get those electronically sent. But I do. I print mine off. I keep all mine in a file. So I encourage you to use that email because it's a, a nice little resource for you. But there are things that we're not allowed to use our computers for, or the school computers, or like I said, when you access uh, on your phone and you're using the Wi-Fi reception from the school. A lot of you may log into it and let you log in as a guest, but that opens up. So another thing that we need to consider, and it kind of goes in with this bullying, uh, potential sexual harassment, other items that opens us up, and this is all for our protection, okay? It's not advisable to have a student on your bus be a friend on your Facebook account. But it's just not good practice, because you may post something on there that, that you may think is appropriate, but the child or the child's parents may not think it's appropriate, and therefore a complaint can be lodged against you. Because whether we realize it or want to admit it or not, as a school board employee, we represent the school board 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're always an employee. We're always going to be the face of Laurel County Transportation Department. Look at what my kid's bus driver posted on Facebook. Can you believe that? So the more that we minimize that, the less instances we have of a complaint. So just be aware that there are certain items we need to to, to not do. School board policies and procedures. You can go to KSBA, that's Kentucky School Board Association. Laurel County is governed by those same uh, policies and procedures. You can go there and they can go over to, to the drop down menus there. In the middle of the page, go back there. Just hit that. And it, or is that just a slide? Okay. Uh, well, you've got drop down menus. Just drop your pointer finger down here. You can select uh, the policy that you're looking for or a procedure, and it drops down and it gives you general, general procedures, general policies, and you can look those up, and it will give you all of the policies and procedures that we are to follow. Do we have any questions about use of technology, school board? procedures and tech and, and policy. Well, let that bring us to this confidentiality. Confidentiality, we deal with that each and every day, whether we realize it or not. We hear conversations every day on the bus. We have those little yellow and blue and white cards, which are emergency cards, which has private information on those and therefore we fall under confidentiality. What is confidentiality? It's confidential information. Uh, we have the, the duty to protect all personally identifiable data, information, and records collected, used, or maintained by an agency. Confidentiality requirements also apply to discussions about students and students' records. So we have those each and every day. What laws protect the student's records? It's the FERPA, which we've been over that with Amy earlier, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. We have KARs that protect those, and the IDA, Individuals with Disabilities Act from 2004, so special needs, falls into its own separate protection area, but that doesn't relieve us because of that. We always Maybe you're a regular bus driver, but you're going to take a field trip and drive a special need. We still fall under the same regulation. And Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and we've all heard that term, 504 plan. So we know that those items are covered. What are educational records? Personal family data, evaluation and test data, 504 plans, progress reports, report cards, work samples, attendance records, written accounts of parent or teachers, conferences, audio or video tapes, electronic information stored on cell phones, PDAs, databases, instant messages, and voice mail reports. 
recordings. One thing that we all do <coughs> is we have write-up sheets. And that has that same data. We can be sharing with other people outside of our work environment this information on these write-ups. Okay, go ahead, Betty. Uh, medical records as well. We're not going to have so much uh, except that we will know the children that have, just like what we went over earlier here with Amy, kids that's going to have the, that's going to be diabetic or they're going to have seizures or we're going to have allergies that will require that emergency medicine. Records maintained by other agencies, health department, private physicians, therapy, occupational therapies, information by agencies used for educational purposes, psychiatric or mental records, discipline records, again, there's a write-up that comes into play, digital computer records, video, audio tape, and film. All of these fall under those. Students' biometric records. A record of one or more measurable biological or behavioral characteristics that can be used for automated recognition of an individual's of the individual, fingerprints, voice prints, handwriting, those type of things. Even that stuff falls under privacy. <clears throat> so what does it mean? What does personally identifiable information mean? Name of the child, parent, or other family member. Address of the child, personal identification number, social security number, student number, indirect identifiers include date of birth, place of birth, mother's maiden name. Information that can be used alone or in combination that specifically links to a child. Characteristics or other information to identify a child. One thing that a few years ago, go back to that last slide, that we did, it was pretty common, it was pretty handy. And just for our new drivers, because it's, it's not a bad idea on the service, we would put our names of the kids above the seats for where they sat even if it was a first name or last name. It seems harmless enough. Well, it's just helping the kid get on to the bus and know to go to the right seat. But what that also does is someone from outside the bus can sit down or be in a car looking up in the bus and be watching that same seat every day and figure out the names of the children that are in that seat. So we don't do it for that reason, protect that identity. All right, go ahead. How does a school district ensure student information and records are kept private? Okay, make sure that all staff is trained in confidential, confidentiality of records. And that includes school-based counselors, volunteers, cafeteria workers, student teachers, paraeducators, substitute teachers, bus drivers, aides, nurses, office staff, custodians, and itinerant teachers. So all employees take this training because we all have access to those records. Rights to inspect records. Now parents, guardians, eligible students must be allowed to inspect or review educational records within a reasonable time, and that's generally within three days that the request is made that they will do that. Confidential. How do we ensure parents see information only about their child. We're not going to be dealing with that so much, but like on a write-up, where it's possible that a parent could see that write-up, you may want to identify another student that's involved in the action as a fifth grader, another fifth grader, another child, so that that other child would not be identifiable on the write-up of a different child which we can carry into a second ride as well. How do we ensure parents when requesting written discipline reports do not sign on the children's name? There we go. When speaking with a parent, do not mention another student. If a parent comes to the bus, who's the name of the kid that hit my son or my daughter? Can't give that to them. I'll handle the situation then with a ride up and administration will take care of it. Do not discuss other students in meetings. You can discuss the plans or strategies that you have to use with, use with other students, but 
thought specifically by name. And do not discuss other students at the grocery store, ball games, church, or etc. And I know it's tough sometimes we bump into each other out in the out in the community, and I've had the worst time with little Sally. She will not keep her mouth shut, and they, all the kids that live out on Rally Road, they're just that same way. Well, you that may be fine for you and whoever you're talking to, but who's on the other side of the aisle? Maybe it's little Sally's grandma. Maybe it's somebody else that lives on Rally Road. And then you've opened up and you've broken confidentiality. Oh, I know that's not the kid she's talking about. So that's what we have to be careful about. We have to be careful about the conversations we have, even outside of the school setting. How do we ensure parents see information about only about their children? Parent and teacher conferences, uh, of course, we're not going to be involved in those so much, but they don't share that confidential information with grandparents, aunts, uncles, neighbors, etc., unless a parent or student representative gives written permission to this third party to hear confidential information. So it has to be by permission. Each school must decide how to document for parent conferences and method of storage. So that's something that's taken out of our control. Facts and information, make sure facts is marked confidential information as well. And that goes along, I know this is, we're talking about students, that goes along with us too, that, that kind of brought to mind situation. Uh, we do have a fax machine there at work. Occasionally you guys have fax, uh, medical records faxed into uh, the fax machine. Make sure that if you don't want that information, and not that we do, but make sure that they mark it confidential so that it doesn't get thrown down on the desk and, and people just go through and say, well, hey, well, let's see what this is. Make sure it's marked confidential and we treat it that way as well. Uh, confidential and email and telephone issues. Don't include student or teacher names or grades in emails. Emails include a confidential st confidentiality statement to your signature for each outgoing email. An email is public record and can be forwarded without your permission or can be subpoenaed if a legal issue <coughs> were to emerge. So remember that when you log into your school email, it is public records and it can be subpoenaed, so be careful about how you do that. Don't give any information uh, out over the phone. You can always identify the person on the other end of the line. And uh, we don't like to do that uh, out of the uh, dispatch, talking to people on the phone, I'll just cover that area too, about getting permission for kids to get dropped off. Because there's no certainty of who I'm talking to on the telephone. They can tell me there's something, but I have no way to identify that. Same way with these records. Email confidentiality example statement. And this should be at the bottom of your email, and you can uh, you can type up a, an example such as this yourself. Notice the electronic email transmissions is for the use of the named individual or entity to which it's directed and may contain information that is privileged or confidential. It is not to be transmitted to or received by anyone other than the name, addressees, or person authorized to deliver it to the name, addressees. It's not to be copied or forwarded to any unauthorized person. If you have received this electronic email transmission in error, delete it from your system without copying or forwarding it and notify the sender of the error by replying via email so that our address record can be Protection for your own self is what this is, folks. Issues regarding electronic information, contents of personal electronic devices may prove to be very embarrassing or provide information that can be used against the school district or you. Consider purpose definition when using cell phones, voicemail recordings, texting, Facebook, etc. That's what we just went back to about when you have your phone and it is through the uh, Wi-Fi from the guest user, or when you're logging on, you fall under that. <coughs> Confidential information includes lesson plans, report cards, individual modification plans. They should all be marked as such as confidential. The substitute folders must include the IEP, any modifications and behavior intervention plans for students with special needs. Always with regard to that information. Unprofessional versus professional sharing of information. And talking to a colleague about a student.
student or his family apply these four questions to determine if the discussion may be violating a student's confidentiality rights. What is discussed? Where the discussion takes place? Now, if we have, here's, a, here's an example of a legal conversation. I'm driving a bus and I know I'm going to have a substitute driver drive my route tomorrow and I know I have a kid that can be a problem for whatever reason. And I'm discussing those issues with the substitute driver, his name, where he sits, where he lives, that type of thing. That's legal. That's a legal allowed discussion. Telling all my buddies about how bad a trouble I'm having with this kid, that's not a, not a legal discussion. Where is it going to be taking place? Try to make those discussions away from the earshot of people that are not concerned with that issue. For who's listening? And then why is the discussion, why did it take place? Well, I was communicating a behavior issue about little Jimmy to the substitute driver so that he could address those issues. And many of you do that already. When you find out you're going to have a substitute bus driver, you talk to them and you tell them. But sometimes we write those down on a note and leave that there for them. Let's make sure we get that done directly to them and not just laying there for anybody that gets on the bus to see. A kid to see. That's all. So who can access student records? Okay. Parents or student representatives or students who are 18 years old or emancipated. We do have kids in the school system that are 18 years old or in the math and their parents have allowed them to make their own decisions and that's fine. And that brings up a couple of issues. Can an 18 year old emancipated student write their own bus note? Yes, they can. Does that mean that they can get on the bus and decide I'm going to go home with my girlfriend today and write that out and hand that to the bus driver? No. It's still got to be signed by principal. We handle an emancipated student's bus note just like we would a five year old or a six year old's bus note. It has to be signed by the principal. And if it's not signed by the principal, look, that child, student, goes either to their original drop-off point or back to their school, which will be a high school in this case. Authorized employees of the district. Staff from the U.S. or State Department of Education and Official Business. Now, those, obviously, we're not going to be needed. But that is the level of confidentiality that they have. Recording of access, the recording of access to records. A school must maintain a log in the student's record that identifies each request and disclosure of student records. The log must be must document name, local, state, federal authorities, and officials that may make further disclosure of the information. Again, that's a that's a human resources central office issue. Do guardians, divorced or separated parents, foster parents, and other surrogate parents have a right to review a student's record? Both parents have a right to view their students' records unless the school has a divorce decree stating otherwise. It would be, it would be court ordered. Joint custody, both parents should be given access to student records and decision making. Foster parents have a right to review records but cannot make educational decisions unless the documentation states otherwise. And parents can request interpretation of records if they don't understand what they're reading. Translation must be provided in their native language. Conditions where prior consent is not required. Disclosure within an agency with legitimate educational interest. Special needs department to the transportation department. Is one example. Officials of another school, school system, or institution post-secondary education where a student seeks or intends to enroll. Director information, audit purposes, subpoenas, and report order financial aid, health, and safety emergencies. The director of information may be disclosed if parents are annually given public notice of the types of information that designated as director information and given the opportunity to refuse. That director information includes student's name, address, phone number, date of birth, participation.
station in an officially recognized sports activity. Students weight, height, and members of the athletic team, dates of attendance, awards received. May a student review and inspect his or her own records. An emancipated student is eligible to uh, access those records upon reaching 18th birthday or marriage. How does the school system release school records? Paralegal guardians or emancipated students must make a written request to release the records and other <coughs> another person or agents. Special ed students or students currently being evaluated submits to the special education department. Not in special education, written requests still obtain and need purposeful release and student information may be released to the Department of Social Services. Again, we're not going to be seeing those types of issues. That's going to be uh, human resources at the administrative level, at the, at the high school, the middle school, or elementary. Here are the requirements of confidentiality. Every employee, and that's us, of Kentucky Public School District must adhere to the confidentiality protection of all students. All students' information should be kept confidential unless disclosure serves professional purposes or is required by law. Failure to do so may result in the revoking of suspending of Kentucky certification. Protecting students' confidentiality is the law and also the right thing to do. They can't take a legal issue if we disclose that information without proper authority. And I, it talks about certification, I'm sure that's on the teacher level. But I'm sure they can also dismiss, for us it would be dismissal of suspension or some type of other disciplinary action. So congratulations, we just completed the confidentiality training requirements. And remember that we are held accountable for maintaining the confidentiality of students' information both at work, home, or out in the community. Any questions? Go home. Nobody? Oh, we can stay here long. All right, we've got a few things here I want to go over real quick. Uh, and we, we don't have much to go, I promise you. We'll be here. All right, I got the Vermont bus pickup. That's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Is that correct, Mark? Hey, Mark. Yes. Bus pickup, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Is that correct? Any three of those days on your bus pickup, you're going to need to go out and drive your route uh, in one of those days. I think Marshall said that you all have time sheets that already has the time filled in for that as well. Remind message, if you, did, if you didn't get the message from me, be sure to get with me or Marshall so we can get you set up for that. I went over the sign-in sheet, I believe.